Uh, all right, so it's uh, indeed a great honor for me to be speaking here at, uh, uh, at Chicago uh, in memory of uh, Professor Nambu. Uh, many people yesterday mentioned uh, two of uh, Nambu's uh, most influential papers. Uh, the one on the top uh, talks about really the global U1 symmetry of a theory of superconductivity and made an analogy with and understood the nature of symmetry breaking, and that led, of course, uh, eventually to the theory of chiral symmetry breaking. Uh, on the other hand, the earlier paper about gauge invariance in the theory of superconductivity seems to be referring not to a, a global symmetry, but, but a gauge invariance, uh, and connecting that to what we would call today the presence of the Higgs particle. So there's really a, a subtle difference between uh, these two physical ideas, which are often mixed up, and, and it gets a bit confusing because uh, in the case of electromagnetism, the actual gauge theory is very weakly coupled. You can just treat it in a mean field or a Gaussian approximation, and certainly in condensed matter, the velocity of light is essentially infinity. Um, so what looks like a global symmetry in one language is really a gauge invariance. Uh, anyway, so these papers of Nambu clarified uh, many of these issues, and. Uh, um, and will play also a role in, in the things I'm going to discuss today. So in high temperature superconductivity, we're going to really treat electromagnetism uh, as just a global U1 symmetry. So the, there's no dynamical electromagnetic gauge field, uh, but there's just a global U1 symmetry in the theory. Uh, but nevertheless, if you take a system of electrons with sufficiently strong interactions, uh, they can form very complicated uh, quantum ground states, and in the modern language, you'd say they'd be states which have long-range quantum entanglement, meaning they're not smoothly connected to any simple product states. Um, and when we think about such states, like the fractal quantum Hall state that, uh, uh, that we just heard about, uh, you need uh, the language of gauge fields. You need emergent gauge fields, which are generally at strong coupling, uh, to come up with a proper description. So, of course, the most celebrated example of this description is the fractal quantum Hall effect. Uh, but there's been a long effort over the last 20 years to understand the high temperature superconductors, especially the highest temperature superconductors found in the whole dope copper oxide compounds. Um, so that theory is still very much a work in progress in many ways, but there have been in the last four or five years a number of exciting experimental developments. Uh, and I'm actually going to focus on just one of them, a very recent one, and try to make the case that uh, this experiment, uh, along with a number of others that I won't have time to talk about, uh, does uh, start to support the case that even in the high temperature superconductors, we do have to use the same language of strongly coupled uh, emergent gauge fields. Okay, so, uh, you know, any talk with the cube rates I give to a general audience, uh, immediately gets confusing because it's uh, a very complicated material. There's no simple theory of everything that uh, Tom Sohn just wrote down that you can just write in one line. It's a, it is a complicated crystal with many different elements, um, but I hope uh, if you stay with me, I'll try to tr explain everything in simple pictures. In the end, also, I think there is some simple microscopic Hamiltonian uh, which realizes some interesting and novel phases, which also have an essential simplicity. Okay, so first of all, you start with a very complicated crystal, but you focus on just one copper oxygen layer. And for the rest of the talk, I ignore the coupling between the layers. And then furthermore, in a single copper oxygen layer, let's just work, uh, think about the, these uh, d orbitals, one on each copper side. So we're going to change the density of electrons on those d orbitals and just ignore all the other orbitals. So then you just have a square lattice of electrons uh, with variable density. So that's getting simple enough. And as a function of temperature and density of those electrons, you have this rather amazing phase diagram, which is only now starting to really fill out and understood. Uh, so I won't really have the time to explain all these acronyms. Uh, I'm just going to focus on a few of them. Uh, and anyway, just you have to take my word for it that through you know, mostly remarkable experimental studies over nearly two decades, I think there's wide consensus that this basic phase diagram applies to 
a whole series of compounds, uh, of which YBCO uh, is, the, is the most well studied and best characterized. So the first feature of this phase diagram is, uh, is the AF at the very left. That's the antiferromagnet, where you have exactly one electron on each side, and they form a structure with half of them up and the other half down. Uh, and you can very clearly see this in various scattering experiments. Furthermore, this is an insulator uh, because the electrons, uh, repulsion between the electrons prevents the, uh, the electrons from hopping. So there's a gap to all charged excitations, but there's no gap to spin excitation. The spins can rotate collectively. And in fact, there's a number Goldstone mode called the spin wave, which has also been seen very beautifully in experiments. So the question we want to ask is what happens when you take this antiferromagnet and then remove a few electrons. So this P here is the density of electrons. So if I start with the antiferromagnet and I remove density P of them, now the Coulomb repulsion doesn't keep these holes from moving around. They can move around with, uh, with no energy cost uh, because this, this electron could hop here, for example. So you, so you can then ask the question, what happens when these holes become completely mobile? So if they be, and there's enough of them. So if they go, become completely mobile and there's enough of them, well, first of all, you expect the spins to average out. And so you might expect you're going to get a metal. And the first question you want to ask then about that metal uh, is, what is, what is the density of holes in that metal? And what is the size of its Fermi surface? So, so there's a standard theorem called the Ludinger theorem in condensed matter that uh, uh, restricts the size of that Fermi surface. Uh, in this case, I'm going to use the language of holes rather than electrons. This has to do with the nature of the underlying band structure of the material. So, but I, since I don't want to go into that complicity, com complexity, let me just say I'm going to talk about holes rather than electrons uh, all the way through. So in terms of holes, the empty state is the filled band with two electrons on each side. So this is the state with no holes, because you can only put two of them. And so then this state, where I put P holes in the antiferromagnet, relative to the, fill, the empty state of holes with two electrons per site, it really has one plus P holes. And this difference between P and one plus P is really the heart of everything I'm going to talk about. And it's the, you know, the heart of the complexity uh, of the theory. So then there's a, a theorem called the Luttinger theorem uh, that says that if you form a metal of fermionic particles uh, with density 1 plus p, then the size of the Fermi surface, uh, the area enclosed by the Fermi surface, modulo factors of 2 pi that I'm going to ignore, uh, should be 1 plus p. Okay, and you know, this is, of course, also very much related to the composite fermion, Fermi surface, where the size was proportional to the magnetic field, as Dom Stone just talked about. Um, so now if you go back to the phase diagram, uh, I'm going to go all the way away from the, this limiting case that's well understood to another limiting case on the right called the FL, or the Fermi liquid, where you indeed see in four-dimension experiment exactly the right size of 1 plus p. Uh, so that's good. So those the two limits are extremely well understood. So another way to measure the size of the Fermi surface, which I'm going to, and this is for the purpose of explaining the recent experiment, uh, is by measuring the Hall effect, again connected to the talk we just heard. Uh, so if you have the, the, the first, first of all, the Fermi surface is the state, is the surface in momentum space separating the states of occupied and empty holes, let's say. Uh, and the Luttinger theorem uh, says that the area enclosed by the surface should be the density of particles, fermions, electrons, or holes. Uh, I guess this, this slide is in terms of electrons, sorry. And then you can measure the Hall coefficient. And it, this is now at relatively small fields, much smaller than which you get the quantum Hall effect. No one's ever, you know, in, in something like uh, copper oxide compounds, you, need, you would need several hundred test clubs if you had any sign of a quantum Hall effect because the density of particles is so much higher than the semiconductors uh, that are in which the fractal quantum Hall effect is seen. Uh, so this is at very low fields. Uh, in that case, you will get the, the, the Hall coefficient in the, as explained in the original theory of Hall in the 19th century. Uh, and then in the modern language of uh, Fermi-liquid theory, you can relate the Hall coefficient 
to the volume enclosed by the Fermi surface. So uh, for the purpose of this talk, the Hall coefficient, uh, if, you, if you measure a temperature-independent Hall coefficient, it's just a proxy for the volume of the Fermi surface. OK, so again, as a so now I'm going to show you the very recent experiment, which actually came out in Nature just this week. Uh, who, who have done a high field, careful study of the Hall coefficient as a function of, of density. Now you might say, you know, why did it take 20 years to do this obvious experiment? Well, of course, there's a long story there. You have to make the best crystals. You need fields of 80 Tesla and the right temperature range. Anyway, so uh, it's, it's, it's easy to be you know, de deceived by how difficult and ingenious these experiments actually are. Uh, anyway, so, so at high P, and indeed, they do see uh, a Hall coefficient, which is proportional. Uh, this is the inverse of the Hall, Hall resistance, which should be the density of, uh, of holes. And, the, and this is the value of 1 plus P. OK, so so far, so good. No surprises. Everything looks perfectly in uh, correspondence with uh, very simple principles of undergraduate solid state physics. Now I'm going to just reveal the rest of this, uh, this uh, experimental data, slowly while explaining the, the physics behind it. Now if you look at very small p, uh, you see a Hall coefficient, inverse Hall coefficient of p. So here the density of carriers is p, but not 1 plus p. Now you would say, well, that's strange. But it turns out that's actually not that mysterious. It can be quite well understood. And it has to do with the fact that what we believe happens at very low p is a breaking of translational symmetry. So the Luttinger theorem, uh, really, of the size of the Fermi surface, holds modulo one electron per unit cell per spin. So if you have a spin density wave that doubles the size of the unit cell, uh, then you know, you, the insulating antiferromagnet has two electrons per unit cell. And so that two doesn't count anymore. Uh, so as a result, if you break the, uh, break the translational symmetry, you can get smaller Fermi surfaces, and everything is still consistent with what you expect. Then, uh, over the past five years, the focus of the study has been in another bit of complexity, the kind of thing that particle physicists hate to hear about because things are getting so complicated, but it's still simpler than a standard model. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is another broken symmetry in this green region, and uh, that's really been the focus of so much work over the last five years. Uh, and uh, it, uh, there it's the charge density wave that forms, and it reconstructs the Fermi surface into even in a even much more complicated way that we're still debating and not well understood. But fortunately, this whole region can be very well uh, identified because it turns out the Hall coefficient here even changes sign. So we're just going to ignore it for the purpose of this talk. So really, what's happening here uh, is the following, that uh, at high doping, you're getting Fermi liquid conventional behavior. At low doping, there's lots of interactions. Uh, and this is giving you some correlated states. But the net effect of the interaction seems to be some sort of broken symmetry. Uh, and if there's a broken symmetry, then after you go to the right unit cell, things again start looking conventional at low energies. So the recent excitement is the final little piece here between around 0.15 and 0.19, uh, where from all the experimental uh, evidence so far, there is no broken symmetry. So what you expected in the absence of any broken symmetry, once you got out of the green region, you would be back to 1 plus p. And that's really most of us, what most of us expected. What you find uh, is you know, several well-identified points with the Hall coefficient. The, in, the density is much smaller than, in fact, very close to p, uh, and rises rapidly to 1 plus p. Now, this is at some finite temperature, and it may well be at, in the limit of zero temperature in high fields. This will stay along the line p and then jump to 1 plus p. So that's, of course, uh, very much a topic of current debate. So here I want to turn the issue from these and many other experiments which I haven't discussed. Uh, in fact, we were talking about this possibility through many different experiments uh, several years ago. Uh, is it, can you get a metal? Is it possible to have a metal with no broken symmetry and the violation of the Luttinger uh, theorem for the size of the Fermi surface? And so this particular metal, yes. Um, what is the error bar? I suppose it's not 
Uh, well, there's a lot of noise in the data because uh, uh, this, is, this is pulsed magnetic fields. Uh, you know, they last a few microseconds, uh, and they're measuring you know very small changes in the resistance or some background, and and so on. So there is just noise in the data, and. Okay, there's many other experiments. Uh, yes, I think, you know, to the accuracy, we are, we are trying to just look at the difference between this and this, and that's certainly clear cut. There's also the photo emission experiments. There are also uh, scanning tunnel microscopy experiments, and they're all, you know, right on top of each other. So th there's really no debate of what's going on here. <laughs> okay, so, so the, the, the most of the remainder of my talk, we now, I'm going to not talk about experiments anymore, uh, but answer the following theoretical question. Is it possible to have a metallic state uh, which has a Fermi surface of size P, in this case, uh, which violates the Leninger volume, and that Fermi surface has ordinary electron-like quasi-particles? And that particular state we, we call FL star, the star meaning it's not, it is almost a Fermi liquid because it's got uh, electron-like quasi-particles, uh, but the star because, well, it's really a different state. So what I'm going to argue through uh, drawing some pictures and a little bit of uh, actual calculation, uh, yes, it's possible to get this. Uh, you get a Fermi surface of electrons, uh, which includes volume P, and, uh, but it could also have other values in the more complex cases, and not the Luttinger volume of 1 plus P. And, and the only way you can do this, uh, I'm going to hope to convince you, is by having a theory which has emergent gauge fields. Uh, and in some ways, it's also connected to ideas from topological field theories. Of course, this state is gapless. It's not, and it's not a conformal field theory. It's got lots of low-energy quasi-particle excitations on the Fermi surface. It's got a linear specific heat. But nevertheless, it's, it coexists, as we'll see, also with global topological excitations of the type we are familiar with in topological field theories. Uh, and I hope to convince you that there's really there's, there's, there's no way around this. If you violate the Leibniz theorem, you're going to have a topological character to your state. And in some sense, the Leibniz theorem is one of the old, oldest uh, uh, realization of topology in, in physics, as I hopefully will convince you. Um, okay, so that's now the real talk starts. Uh, so this is the, where what I want to get to. I probably won't, but I'll begin with a simpler case of a well-understood realization of topology in topological field theory uh, in in, uh, in condensed matter, and then I'll connect mo move on to the a proof of the Leibniz theorem. But I'll give a very different proof based on a topological argument. And once you see this this proof, it becomes very clear how you could violate the Leibniz theorem. The second part, I don't know how much I'll get to it, is then assuming the existence of FL star with volume P and FL with volume 1 plus P, there's the question of what is the nature of the phase transition between them. And, and many people, I think, agree that's the central, difficult, open problem in the whole field. And this maybe has things to do with uh, the strange metal state that's found at optimal doping that at least I'll briefly mention. Okay, so let's... Uh, stay on firm ground to begin with, let me just review uh, some now well-established ideas on insulating states and their connection to topological field theory. So this was the antiferromagnet I talked about. So I'm not going to dope the system yet. So I still have one electron per site. But now imagine that I frustrate the system or something else, and, and the electrons form singlets with each other in this way. Uh, so that lowers at least the energy of exchange interaction on that bond. Uh, but the other bonds are not too happy. So you can make all of them happy by resonating between the valence bonds. So you get this famous resonating valence bond state, uh, which was actually proposed uh, a long time ago by Pauling as a theory of metals, uh, by analogy with things like graph uh, by the resonance in, of valence bonds in graphene. Uh, oh, benzene, sorry. <laughs> he didn't know about graphene. <laughs> uh, so uh, as, as you'll see by the end of my talk, actually Pauling uh, wasn't right. Uh, it's not a theory of metal like lithium, but it is almost a theory 
um, of this FL star state. Uh, later on, in a very influential work, Anderson pointed out that the right playground for Laughlin's wave function is, in fact, in more insulators. And you could imagine more insulators where you realize the state. In modern language, we would say that uh, the Pauling-Anderson state is really the first proposal, as far as I know, of a quantum state uh, that has long-range entanglement. Long-range entanglement, for example, being that if you compute the entanglement entropy, uh, there's a universal topological deficit in the entanglement entropy, and so on. Uh, and it's really the first state that Laughlin's state was the next one, but this is uh, even earlier. Uh, so jumping ahead to many years of developments, uh, today we would say that this kind of state is described by the following topological field theory, uh, which is called the Z2 spin liquid, uh, because in these early works we formulated uh, as a theory of uh, compact U1 gauge field coupled to a charge 2 Higgs field. Uh, but the essential topological and long-range properties are described by a uh, doubled U1 Chun Simons theory, uh, two U1 gauge fields, and a K matrix, which is this very simple matrix. And this is really the simplest theory which preserves time reversal uh, and has a non trivial topological properties, and in particular, more than one ground state on a torus. And, it, and now there's you know, a huge amount of evidence that for certain spin models, uh, this state is indeed realized. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's very much the same character of what Pauling and Anderson proposed a long time ago. So these connections between discrete gauge theories, compact U1 gauge theories, and Simon's theories have also much appeared uh, in the particle physics literature uh, by many people in the audience. Uh, the early paper by Fratkin and Schenker, which connected discrete gauge theories to compact U1 gauge theories. And this paper that Nati told me about, but I don't understand it at all, but apparently it says similar things, correct? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, so in this language, this Chern Simons theory uh, has one basic property that if you put the theory on a torus, then it has a d degeneracy in the ground state because you can get non trivial fluxes uh, through the cycle of the torus, and these fluxes along different cycles of the torus. Are, don't commute with each other, and then you, when you diagonalize uh, that resulting Hamiltonian, you get a ground state degeneracy. Uh, in, in the condensed matter language, this is not an exact degeneracy, but in a system with a gap, it approaches uh, degeneracy in the infinite volume limit. Now, you can also see this degeneracy, as many people pointed out, uh, in this Pauling Anderson wave function. So here's the one snapshot of the wave function, we, and we make a cut. Uh, which is uh, the same as the Wilson line in the Chen Simons theory. Now you make this cut here, uh, and, you, and you notice that there's a conservation law. And the conservation law is that the number of these valence bonds crossing this imaginary cut is preserved mod 2. So as I resonate from any local rearrangement, uh, so I do some local rearrangement, now it's 4, 4, 2, you know, 2, 0, and so on. So no local rearrangement can possibly change the parity uh, of the number of bonds crossing this cut. So there's two possibilities, the even and the odd uh, states. Uh, and if the system is large enough, they have almost exactly the same energy since they only differ by some global, uh, uh, global quantum number, uh, which is very hard to access by any local Hamiltonian. So that's the, the physical picture of why this state is topological and how it's connected to Chen Simon's uh, gauge theories. All right, uh, so topic two. Uh, so what is this connected to the introduction of my talk, where I talk about metals and Fermi surfaces, things that are not so familiar to many in this audience. So perhaps to present solid state physics in a, in a more familiar language, let me give you an argument due to Urshikawa um, it, it's not quite a proof, but it's very close enough to a proof uh, for a condensed matter physicist of the Luttinger uh, theorem. And the beauty of the proof is that uh, it really shows you what the correct physics of the Luttinger theorem is, uh, not that of summing an infinite number of diagrams and complicated water entities that nobody understands, which is the way it was proved originally. But it also shows you uh, how you can get around it, what you need to get a quantum state that wouldn't obey it, which is also metal. 
So you take your, for now, you know, electronic system on some lattice, and you put that lattice on a torus. Uh, so you take n particles carrying charge Q of, this is a global charge Q, on an LX by LY lattice. So I'm actually going to go through a little bit of this calculation. Uh, now we pierce, now we are going to gauge that global symmetry. So it turns out for every global U1 symmetry, there is a Luttenger theorem. So in any system that has a global U1 symmetry, and you put a chemical potential conjugate to that global symmetry, there, has, there is a theorem that you, you need to obey. And the one way to obey it is by having a Fermi surface. But as we'll see, there are other ways of obeying it. Uh, but right now, I make no assumption this is, a, this is rigorous. Uh, so we're just going to adiabatically insert one flux quantum through this hole of the torus. So, so right now, I, this is just an exact result. I'm not take any quantum system. This could be an insulator. It could be anything. Right now. Well, uh, so it's a finite system. So I'm inserting it very slowly, right? Compared to the to the the gap, the, the discreteness of the energy level. Okay. So I insert one flux quantum adiabatically. So now, as I'm inserting this flux quantum, I can always choose the gauge to make. Uh, to preserve translational symmetry along the x direction. So there's a momentum quantum number, and as I insert flux, there's an electric field that acts on the particles, and the system momentum will change. Uh, now, once I've inserted one flux quantum, I'm back to the original Hamiltonian up to a gauge transformation. Uh, and from that fact, you can prove that the momentum of the final state minus the momentum of the initial state uh, is, is 2 pi times the number of particles divided by Lx, mod 2 pi. This is really very simple. If you take one electron, you can see this yourself. If you have one electron on a ring, you insert one flux quantum, uh, then you undo the gauge transformation to get back to the original state. You see that its momentum has shifted by 2 pi over L, uh, and interactions preserve momentum, so they don't affect it. And so you just add up the, the momenta of each of the electrons, and that's the answer. So that's the, the exact statement. It's just the momentum counting. Now, if you don't like waving my hands, here's the actual proof. Uh, so this is, this is still very, very general, proving this statement, that for every global U1 symmetry, uh, you have this fact that inserting one plus quantum gives you a change in momenta given by this quantity. So the point here is that the initial and final state after the flux insertion are related by a gauge transformation, and here's a unitary operator that generates a gauge transformation. Now, as you insert the flux, there's a very complicated time evolution from the initial wave state to the final state, with ut, the time evolution operator. This is very complicated. We have no idea what it is. Uh, but now, if you figure out the change in momentum, we, need, don't, don't, we shouldn't compare the translation eigenvalue of this state to that one, because they're in different gauges, you've got to undo the gauge transformation. So you have to compare the momentum of the initial state to this state, where you undo the gauge transformation. So now you imagine that the initial state is an eigenstate of momentum, and the final state is also an eigenstate of momentum. This defines the value of p modulo 2 pi. Um, then that's needed because of discreteness of the lattice. Now, as I said earlier, translations commute with the time evolution operator, provided you choose the gauge cleverly. Um, and then from these explicit definitions, you can work out what translation does to the gauge transformation. It picks up this factor right here. And you just now use this, and you have the result. OK. So this is an exact result. It's a constraint really of any system. Uh, well. OK. Yeah, maybe I haven't even used that. Right. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you. All right, now I've come to uh, the subtle part. This is the non-exact part. So now I'm, I'm going to use adiabaticity. So I have some complicated interacting system. I'm slowly inserting a flux. So I'm going to assume that the effect of the flux is only to excite some very low energy excitations. So I'm going to define a Fermi liquid. A Fermi liquid is a state of matter whose only low energy excitations are quasi-particles around the Fermi surface, and nothing else. Everything else is a composite, is a particle-hole pair, or, or, or a bond state, or something like that. 
That's the, the Hilbert space is just given exactly by the set of quasi-particles near the Fermi surface. So each of these quasi-particles we assume is weakly interacting, so they just behave like a free particle. So each of them will pick up momentum 2 pi over L. So if this was my original Fermi surface, uh, at least near the Fermi surface, each of the, the particles from here will, will move to the right, and those will move over there. Okay. So really, the simplest way to actually see this is to imagine there's quasi-particles everywhere, uh, and then the whole sphere moves. But really, the quasi-particles only exist near the surface, and that's sufficient because that's where the changes are happening anyway. Uh, no occupation number changing in the center. So now, however, if you use the, the idea that they are everywhere, uh, just as a fiction, just to evaluate the, ch uh, the change in momentum, so you can, this is the change in momentum, you can rewrite it as a surface integral, and then you integrate by parts, and you end up getting it's delta P times basically the volume enclosed by the Fermi surface. All right, so you get uh, this result. This is the basic result you get that the delta px, which must be equal to this by an exact argument, for a system with only quasi-particle excitations, it must be equal to this. Uh, now you can do this in the other direction. Uh, all right, and now you play some mathematical games. You take lattices of different size, which have mutually co-prime, and you demand this holds for uh, any sets of Lx and Ly, which are mutually prime, and then eventually, after some simple number theory, you end up with the main, main result, that the density of particles equals the volume of the Fermi surface divided by 4 pi squared, that's in two dimensions, it will be 2 pi to the d in general, plus p, p is any integer here, p is not the doping, this is a bad notation, p is any integer, and this is for spinless electrons. If you had spin fold, this would be 2p. Okay. So that's the argument, uh, and its argument applies to any global U1 symmetry uh, in any system uh, on, really. Uh, that this is true for any system, and then the assumption, the additional assumption that the only low energy excitations are quasi-particles on the Fermi surface contains the volume of the Fermi surface. Okay, so having presented that, now it should seem very obvious how you get around it. Well, the way you get around it uh, is by having other low energy excitations. <laughs> That's it. So if you had a system which had not just quasi-particles, but some other low energy excitation, and that low energy excitation only needs to exist on a torus. It may not exist in the bulk. Only when you put it on a torus, there's an almost zero energy state. So if you had any such state, uh, then that could take up, that could be, that needs to be accounted for in the momentum balance. And the Z2 spin liquid that I talked about earlier with this uh, flux through the cycle is exactly the ticket. If you work through the argument and allow for that flux through the cycle to develop, uh, you find that you can get a, a Fermi surface of size P and not the Leidenger volume of 1 plus P. So that's the, that's the argument, basically, that you can violate Leidenger theorem, but the Leidenger theorem being topologi topological really means that uh, if you violate the Luttinger theorem and have a different Fermi volume, then you must have almost zero energy global topological excitations. And the Z2 FL star state is the simplest state where that, that can be, uh, that realizes this. Okay, so now let me just give you a picture of this uh, metallic topological state, for want of a better word. So here's the uh, spin liquid I've been showing you. Uh, now I remove some electrons, so density P of holes. Uh, so now you can get the usual resonance uh, between the valence bonds as before, but you can also get processes in which this hole moves, uh, like that. So, now, so as it moves around, you might think, well, this guy uh, could, carry a, could form a Fermi surface if it's a fermion. Uh, and, and that's correct, it could happen. Uh, but that's not really compatible with the experiment. And this idea goes back early on, was uh, discarded because it didn't look like any of the experiments. And the reason it's not like the experiments is that this mobile, firm, if it's a fermion, which, uh, and that really depends on the details of the Hamiltonian, 
uh, it doesn't carry any spin. So it's, even if you get a Fermi surface, it's some very exotic Fermi surface that you're never going to see in a photoemission experiment because uh, it doesn't have the electron spin. So the, the resolution then is actually very simple. So imagine, so this is the dope spin liquid state you're starting with. But imagine, uh, for some reason, some of the uh, valence bonds break apart into these spins. And the spins move around, and then eventually they all go next to the hole. And then for some reason, there's an attraction between these two. Uh, so they attract and bind and form a new bond. But this bond is just an electron. It's a single electron, which is hopping back and forth between two sides. So now I have a new model of dimers with dimers of two colors, uh, the blue and the green. And, this state, and these green guys have to be fermions. That's because they have the same quantum numbers of, as the electron. Uh, they've got charge E um, and spin a half. And now you can imagine some liquid-like state in which the, the blue and greens are exchanging. And so the green being fermionic particles are moving around. And they can form a Fermi surface. And the blues uh, can resonate. And that represents the emergent gauge field. So the point is that this very simple picture, cartoon, shows you how you can get a state with both features. You can have a Fermi surface of the wrong volume, and it has the topological character because everything is a dimer. In particular, the old argument for the ground state degeneracy goes through without any trouble. You again count the number of dimers cutting uh, the red line, and it's also preserved modulo 2, provided you count it in a colorblind way. You count both the green and the blue. So, so you can get a state where you don't have the right, you have a Fermi surface of the wrong volume, and you still have, you know, the, the Chen Simon's theory describing the topological degeneracy basically preserved. Anyway, so, so that's, the, uh, that's the story then in a very simple manner, just in terms of cartoon picture, how you can get a state uh, which violates the, the Ludendorff theorem. And these recent experiments, this is certainly a personal point of view. I shouldn't say this is by, uh, you know, universally accepted yet. The very recent experiments, I claim, uh, really offer strong evidence for, for this kind of state uh, as understanding the underdope regime. Okay. So I finish at 11.30, is that right? right? Okay. Um, all right. So now uh, let me now go back to the phase diagram and uh, tell you about some, very briefly, about ongoing work on, on the issue this raises. So what I've argued so far is that this PG region uh, is, is this FL star state. It's a Fermi liquid with an asterisk because it's also topological. Uh, I, have, I won't say anything about the DW, but that's been the story of my life for a long time. Uh, and then at high doping, I showed you you have this FL state. Now, so in between then, you have possibly one or maybe even more quantum critical points. And, and the general idea, which is, I think, quite generally accepted, that whatever the quantum critical point is here, as you can see, my favorite one would be the one between FL star and FL, uh, transition between two different metals. Uh, it's a confinement transition because here you have a deconfined gauge field and here you don't. Uh, controls this strange metal that's up there at higher temperatures. Okay, so I'm going to come back to the strange metal in a few minutes, uh, but let me just give you the flavor of the, uh, the kind of theories you need to have this, such a phase transition. So this is something that I've been thinking about for many years, and uh, what you get from the constraints, and this sounds complicated, but this seems like, to me, is like the minimal theory that can give you a transition between a small Fermi surface and a large Fermi surface. This thing, oh, sorry. There should be no star there, I'm sorry. It's these two FL star at FL. Uh, so this is a usual Fermi liquid, and, and this is a deconfined fractionalized state with also electron quasi-particles. So the simplest theory that uh, fits really all the experimental constraints, according to me, uh, is a theory with actually, which is an SU2 gauge theory. And, uh, you can derive it, you know, in kind of a hand-waving way of the kind of things that... But I'm not presenting it because I, I suspect this audience, that derivation won't go over very well. But in the end, you get a theory which 
uh, has a, a, you postulated a deconfined SE2 gauge field, a fermion, uh, which carries fundamental SE2 gauge charge and has a large Fermi surface. So it's got a, uh, now that, the two of these, the combination of two of these uh, is the theory of, uh, uh, of the, uh, what is the color, uh, the, you know, quark gluon plasma, which is believed to become a color superconductor. So this may also become a color superconductor. However, right at the critical point, uh, there is a complex Higgs field, which transforms as an SU2 adjoint. Uh, and this, when the Higgs field condenses, you get the Z2FL star. Uh, and when it's, when, it's, uh, when it's gapped, then probably you go into the color superconductor or perhaps the Fermi liquid. And you need another boson to carry the spin. Anyway, so if you look at the general phase diagram of a theory like this, you can, uh, I mean, the bottom line is you get a transition between a Higgs phase, which where a Z2 gauge theory is left over and realizes the Z2 FL star. Uh, okay, so there's, for, there's two directions. So you have one each field, but so you have two real fields in two directions. So there are really four. But, so it's an SO3 Higgs field, if you wish. It transforms like a matrix, three by three matrix of SO3, and that's why it breaks SU2 down to Z2. So there's a Z2 uh, phase, which is precisely the phase I've been describing so far. Uh, this is a you know, field theoretic way of getting that, uh, thing I presented to you by simple pictures. But the same theory can also have confining phases um, across some ill-understood intermediate uh, states. And that this is pretty much, very much work in progress, uh, but it, it's really, to me, quite amazing to see how this very simple model gives you, you know, a theory then which has uh, SU2 and it has the global U1, so it's kind of like an SU2 cross U1 theory too, <laughs> but it just comes out of just very simple constraints on, on the nature of these states. All right, so in the last 15 minutes, I'm going to change gears a little bit. Uh, what I want to talk about here, rather than instead of focusing specifically on a particular theory of the strange metal, so what this is meant to be ultimately is to describe this strange metal here in this no man's land between the pseudo gap and the Fermi liquid. This is, uh, this is the region with the famous linear resistivity. So what's turned out, I think, to be a very fruitful way to think about this is to think of this strange metal as one element of a very broad class of systems. And the common property between all these systems uh, is that they are systems which are not Fermi liquids. So first of all, they are compressible systems. There's some density that's conserved and whose density you can vary smoothly. Uh, and, and, and that global U1 symmetry is not broken. But it's not a Fermi liquid, and it has, in fact, no quasi-particles. So strange metal and superconductors are one. The uh, graphene, we argued a few years ago, under the right condition, also realizes this. Uh, conformal field theories turn out to be the simplest example of strange metals once you add a weak chemical potential at finite temperature. Uh, and all of these are connected, in some ways, to the dynamics of charged black holes. Uh, so what I'm going to present to you are some recent experiments on graphene, which we can now understand from purely condensed matter methods. But the equations we wrote down for that strange metal in graphene, we first came upon by thinking about charged black hole horizons. But that's not the way I'm going to present it. So here's kind of a pictorial idea of what transport in metals looks like. On the left, I have transport in conventional metals, and on the right, I have a strange metal. Okay, this is of course a cartoon, so don't take it too literally, but it's a very useful picture. So a metal has lots of electrons in a very dense gas, but most of the electrons don't matter. The only thing that matters are a few excitations near the Fermi surface. And those excitations near the Fermi surface just basically move independently of each other. So this, so there's a, so metal, you know, it's called a Fermi liquid, but actually it's a Fermi gas. It's a gas like the gas in this room. Uh, these particles are moving all independently of each other. Now, these obstacles here are impurities. So you, you need them in, to understand any experiment. And 
So when you have independent gas of fermions, colliding of impurities, you have a description of basically every experiment in solid state physics, in metals. You have what's called ohmic transport. You get V equals IR, uh, or more precisely, J equals sigma E, and del dot J equals zero. Those two equations describe current flow in essentially any material. Okay, so that's the conventional theory. And the crucial property of this theory is that momentum conservation doesn't play any role. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the quasi-particles see an impurity before they see each other. So the momentum of the quasi-particle is very quickly lost. Here, it's a very different situation. Here, for so, you know, I don't, you know, imagine this is, say, some conformal field theory, and then you're talking about some excitations above the quantum conformal field theory, which are not uh, particles, and then you have some density of them. You turn on a chemical potential on a conformal field theory at finite temperature. So let me just use the language of electrons. So these are some particles which collide with each other so often that the particle itself ceases to exist. So it's just some set of colliding particles. But while they're colliding with each other, uh, they're preserving energy and momentum. So the collisions, most of the collisions of these particles do not give you any resistance or, uh, because there's complete conservation of momentum. So, so interparticle collisions happen more frequently than particle impurity collisions. So eventually that, little, that fluid or this liquid, this is really a liquid, will go around the impurity and how it goes around the impurity then determines what you see in the experiment. Okay. Uh, all right, so now let me talk about graphene, which turned out to be uh, the example of the strange metal that I believe is best understood today. So again, this is 10 minutes, great, I'm right on time. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, okay, honeycomb lattice of carbon atoms is described as uh, Stone told us by four massless Dirac fermions. I've shown one of them. But now I'm going to apply a gate voltage on top of this. Uh, change the uh, density of electrons. Uh, so if you have a positive gate voltage, you get a Fermi surface. Uh, and now if you measure the resistance of the piece of graphene with the gate voltage, uh, you would see the quasi-particle that sit near this Fermi surface. Uh, that's, look, so the transport would look like this. Uh, and on the other side, if you add a voltage of the opposite sign, then you get a hole-like Fermi surface. So what we argued was that, yeah, this is perfectly fine, but then there's an interesting point right in between, where you're near the Dirac point, where the interactions between the electrons are actually very strong, and up to logarithms, it does appear that the quasi-particles will break down. So in terms of temperature and density then, on this side at low temperatures, you have the whole Fermi surface, here the electron Fermi surface, but in between, uh, you have a strange metal or a Dirac liquid with Coulomb interactions between the uh, electrons. So, of course, this, so this theory is actually asymptotically free in the infrared, meaning if you go to very, very low energies, the interaction goes to zero. But it takes a long time for that to happen. So we just assume the log is still of order one. It's sort of the opposite of QCD, which at very high energies is free, but at reasonable temperatures at RIC, it doesn't look free at all. It looks like a, a plasma. So in, so in this regime, we expect a plasma behavior. So the experiments, one of the, I'm going to show you two experiments. Uh, one of, and they both appeared in Science a couple of weeks ago. Uh, one of them by Philip Kim and my group was to look at thermal transport. I didn't do the experiment. We were just talking <laughs> to the experimentalist. Uh, uh, and what we're going to show you is the ratio of the thermal conductivity to the electrical conductivity. So one very useful quantity, then, is something called the Wiedemann-Franz ratio, which is precisely the ratio of the thermal conductivity to the electrical conductivity, sigma. And any system with quasi-particle transport, with ohmic transport, this is equal to, with no corrections, precisely this uh, number given by fundamental constants. Uh, and it's obeyed, you know, it's obeyed at low temperatures exceedingly well in essentially any metal, as this plot shows. So what I'm going to now present is the measurement of exactly the same ratio uh, as a function of temperature and density. 
And what would you expect in this region and in this region? Uh, it should take this value. And, and we predicted, and I'll go show you our predictions, what it should do in here. And really, to work those predictions out, it's essential to have a, what you can see is a theory of this thing. So it's a liquid flowing around impurities. So that's, that's really what you have to work out. Uh, so this is, these are the results in this color plot. And indeed, as expected, at low temperatures on this side and this side, you do see the Vivian Franz value. Okay, the color is a bit off. If you plot it up, it's very close to one. But contrary to what I've talked about so far, uh, you see the blue value even across, all the way across. And that's because, well, because of the disorder. I didn't, the th this phase diagram I presented earlier was for zero disorder. So if you're at very low temperatures, then the electron-electron interactions happen so rarely that even near the Dirac point, the impurity scattering is more important. Uh, so at low temperatures, you're basically limited by disorder, and you're not going to see this liquid-like flow of, of, of electrons. So that's why you still see the vitamin franz value. And at high temperatures, phonon kick in. So in fact, when we proposed this in 2008, uh, people said, no chance. Either disorder or phonons are going to kill you. Uh, but fortunately, Philip Kim uh, forged ahead and eventually found a clean enough sample where there's a nice sweet spot in the center where there's a large violation of the vitamin franz law. Sorry. Uh, and presumably, the picture is this kind of transport. OK, so, uh, so here I show a comparison of the density dependence of this Lorentz ratio uh, for different samples uh, with fits that follow this formula. So this is a complicated looking formula, which we first did, well, some version of it we derived using black holes in the limit of tau, impur tau impurity goes to infinity. Today, this formula has been obtained by charged black hole solutions using massive gravity, using a certain axion model, you get exactly this formula. Uh, you can also get it from relativistic hydrodynamics with momentum loss and many other and memory function methods and so on. Uh, so the basic formula assumes is in, in terms of the Fermi velocity, the temperature, the quantum critical conductivity. This is the conductivity of pure graphene at zero doping uh, and the enthalpy density. And Q is the quantity we know very well. That's the density of electrons. And tau imp is the re momentum relaxation time. So this is assuming point-like momentum uh, relaxation. Now, the model works reasonably well, but there are certain details that don't work, but I'm going to not go into that. There's, a mo there's an improved model that uh, my student Andy Lucas proposed, where rather than taking point-like impurities, you take kind of gently uh, modulated puddles of uh, electrons and holes, and, and that fits the data reasonably well. But let me just show you another very beautiful experiment. Another beautiful experiment. I'm not sure this is beautiful. Now, this one is certainly beautiful, a beautiful idea of Levitov and Falkovich. So imagine you have some sheet of metal, and you inject some current. And now if you solve Ohm's law, meaning you have transport like this, you'll find that this is how the current flows. This is, you know, the solution, if you had some, if you just made this thing a network of resistors and you solved, you know, Kirchhoff's laws and V equals IR on the network of resistors between a source there and a strain here, this is the current pattern you'll get. Okay. On the other hand, if you took this same source strain configuration, would you solve some version of Navier Stokes equation where your momentum conservation is important? It's not perfect because there are impurities, but at least over some length scale, uh, momentum conservation is important. And what happens is that uh, the liquid-like thing that's flowing here will drag the electrons on the other side, and if conditions are right, you'll develop a vortex, where there's no such vortex here. So now you see in this region here, you have, back, you have current flowing this way, whereas over here, you have current flowing the other way. Okay, so that's the negative local resistance. Uh, and this is seen in this experiment of Andre Geim and collaborators, again, a few weeks ago in science. So this is the sheet of graphene. They inject electrons here. They measure the voltage over there. Uh, and at low temperatures, 
uh, at moderately high temperatures also, the seed is negative resistance. Actually, the seed over a much wider regime than our experiment saw the violation of Wiedemann France law, so we're a bit puzzled by this data. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's in the right direction, and uh, I'm sure there's going to be many new experiments. So, with a couple of you know, hints in earlier experiments, these are really the first two experiments to show uh, viscous flow of electrons in, in metals. Normally it's ohmic flow, but in a strange metal, where you have very strong electron-electron scattering, and that converts the electron gas into a liquid, and that liquid, and, and that happens on a time scale and length scale shorter than the impurity uh, spacing. So you need a clean enough system, uh, and graphene seems to finally be clean enough. Anyway, so the, uh, the Harvard did a press release, and this is what the uh, artist came up with. Uh, when we told him that we had a metal that behaves like water, but anyway. <laughs> uh, okay, so I, I'm, I guess I'm basically done. So what I've talked about here in the second part of my talk is ideas on strange met the strange metal regime. We're, we're certainly hoping that these ideas I've just presented that seem to be reasonably successful in graphene are going to be now applied to other materials, particularly the cuprates and other strange metals. Uh, and so now we have a kind of point of view, which in retrospect looks kind of obvious, but it's, it's an interesting history how these ideas developed, and eventually many different approaches using memory function, hydrodynamics, and holography all seem to be coming together. Uh, and in the first part of my talk, just to remind you, I talked about this other regime, the pseudogap, where it's a much less strange object because it's made up of two well-understood parts. It's made up of a Fermi surface of quasi-particles, electron-like quasi-particles, but a small one, and a topological field theory, uh, this Z2 spin liquid. Uh, and the coexistence of these two properties, uh, the wrong size of the Fermi surface and the global topological excitations are, we believe, required by these flux uh, piercing arguments that I presented. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a way of quantifying how good the approximation of replacing the three-dimensional crystal yttrium barium copper oxide by two-dimensional plane really is? Um, quantifying. Well, I mean, we know, for example, that the resistance in the th third axis can often... Well, for example, if when you go into superconducting state, the penetration depth along the plane uh, versus the penetration depth along the third axis which is some measure of the coupling between the planes, is you know, a factor of 100 larger in the third direction. So it's you know, on that order. The, the coupling in the third direction is much, much weaker. You know, the same things apply to resistivity in the normal state. There's huge anisotropies to any property perpendicular to the layers. Uh, right. Now, I mean, right. So I think it's... You know, once you go to something like a, an ordered phase, like this density wave phase or the superconductor, then if you have infinite correlation length in this direction, then certainly the coupling between the layers becomes important. So, but if, so when you have long range order uh, with long correlation length, then you cannot treat it as a 1D, 2D system anymore. But before you get there, if you're talking about you know, I think on much shorter scales here, of you know, less than 0.1 micron, then I'm, I'm sure it's a, all the experiments indicate uh, that it's a very good approximation. Actually, one, yeah, one, uh, one of the best one is just to look at photoemission. Uh, you know, the bulk photoemission that you see in this kind of data here. Uh, okay, I showed you at the very beginning this. Uh, Fermi surface there. So that, that Fermi surface is purely two-dimensional. And, uh, and sorry, and you can uh, measure the warping in the third direction by quantum oscillation experiments. So that's also been measured. And it's a you know, couple of percent at most. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's this Fermi surface, just a cylinder with slight warping in the third direction. 
So, I mean, the idea is that each, especially if our picture of, you know, uh, this FL star or these topological states is correct, then the idea is that each layer forms this topological state, and then you couple them weakly together. Uh, uh, but that topological order, once it's formed in a, in a layered system, is completely robust to weak coupling. Uh, you get a 3D stack topological state. Yeah. yeah. Do you have an idea what is the chance that we can choose turbulence? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, that's, that would be very exciting. People are thinking about it. Uh, no one's seen it yet. But, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I think many people are, that's one of the races. I think the, the, the experimental, next set of experiments, one perhaps to see, you know, vortices physically, uh, vortex shedding or turbulence in graphene or some even cleaner system, or see similar effects in, in not in graphene, but in, 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 co in an oxide in copper oxide compounds. Uh, I know many, many experimentalists are thinking about that right now. So, wait a few years, I, I'm sure they will, I expect there will be some, some progress. <laughs> I mean, uh, this idea on graphene, you know, it took, uh, in 2008, we were talking about these sort of experiments, and seven years later, I'm happy I'm still alive to see them, so let's see. <laughs> You mentioned the, the, one of the distinctions between the Z2 FL star and FL state was this uh, violation of Luttinger's theorem. I wondered mm -hmm. if, if you could discuss other signatures of the Z2 FL star, Z2 FL star state besides the violation of Luttinger's theorem. Is there, are there other clear signatures one could look for? Um, you mean experimental signatures? I mean, numerically, of course, there's many signatures. We talk about numerics. And then, so <laughs> well, so one was the Hall effect, right? That was the Hall effect is P. So that was a the signature that they've seen. So I mean, what we'd like to see next is quantum oscillations. They haven't seen that yet. Uh, these are diff difficult experiments in very high fields, but uh, maybe, maybe they'll see those. Uh, you know, there's of course these, uh, these flux piercing experiments that Senthil and Fisher talked about a long time ago. Uh, I don't, you know, it seems like these lower temperature phases are confining phases, so I'm not sure those experiments would really work at low temperatures, but you know, one could now imagine doing a flux piercing experiment uh, across this transition here uh, and a functional magnetic field. So at high magnetic field, there seems to be a metal, which is Z2FL star, let's say. And then if there's a superconductor at slightly lower fields, that very difficult experiments could be done there. I mean, certainly that's not a regime people ever looked at. People are looking down here where it's not going to work, even. The, so that would be the smoking gun where you actually see something topological. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I would say that if you accept this theorem, this flux piercing argument, uh, then uh, measuring the wrong size of the Fermi surface is equivalent to measuring topological order. <laughs> so, measuring topological order becomes much easier in a metal than in an insulator. 